We're here to talk about marketing, and so I want to ask you, first of all, your company is called salesforce.com, yes. but you're very interested in marketing. Why? I am. Uh, well, it's a, great, it's a great question, and uh, you know, when we started Salesforce 15 years ago, um, we focused on the whole idea of the most important way to connect with your customer was with your sales organization, and we wanted to make it crystal clear to our customers, or potential customers at that time, that the opportunity that we had was to automate their sales organizations. Um, there had been other organizations who had kind of come along to do customer relationship management, um, but we wanted to focus really in, uh, in the Salesforce automation area. And uh, lo and behold, customers wanted a simpler, easier uh, way to manage their uh, customer information, contacts, accounts, opportunities, forecasts, uh, reports. And um, you know, behold uh, uh, the growth of Salesforce. Um, we transitioned then into having a second product, which was customer service. Uh, customers wanted to not just manage their sales organizations, but also manage their customer service as well, manage their cases and solutions. Uh, then companies came to us and said, well, you know, we don't call them accounts, we call them hospitals, we don't call them contacts, we call them consumers. So we transformed our, our, our service and we gave it the ability to be a platform, start to highly customized, build applications, do all kinds of uh, kind of um, uh, cool things to make it exactly for you. Uh, and that uh, then evolved into uh, building communities so our customers could build communities with their, uh, with their, uh, with their uh, customers and as well as building custom applications. But then this incredible shift happened, which was that our customers started to come to us and say, we want to connect with our customers in new ways. And that uh, really opened the door for us uh, for marketing. And um, uh, it felt very comfortable. It felt what we were doing already. It didn't really seem, even though we call it marketing, it's not really marketing. It's really about customer management. And it doesn't matter if you're a, a company like was just sitting with my friend there, Mark, who used to be at Coca-Cola, now he's a Unilever in the B2C area, or if I was with uh, Time Inc. here with my friend Norm Perlstein when uh, you know, we were uh, uh, selling to Time, which was a B2B customer as well as a B2C customer. In all cases, companies are trying to redefine their customer relationships. And that is a huge shift. And you talk about, you use the expression one-to-one -one customer journeys. What's a, what's a, why a journey? What's a journey? Well, it really comes out, you know, from our roots. You know, when we were started our, our, our company, you know, that, that's what you're doing. You know, you're a salesman, you're, you're in the field, you're selling to a customer, you know your customer really well, you have an intimate relationship with the customer, and you're moving that customer along, you know, you're, we call it seed and grow, you know, you're starting small, you're, you're moving forward, you're landing, you're expanding, there's a lot of terms that we use in Salesforce automation. Um, but when you're looking at this new world, we're not talking about uh, individuals that you have a direct relationship face-to-face -face with every single customer, though in some cases you do, but very, very large sets of customers. And that means that you have to redefine what does that mean. And so the frame that we've put around it is a journey. And let me explain to you what that means. The idea is that you're on a customer journey. That is, you know, we're, we're all on a journey together and you have a customer and that customer may be a prospect. They may, you know, just be somebody who's come to your website. It may be somebody that you meet here at a trade show. It may be somebody um, that you uh, just have had some kind of cursory experience, but they've come into your customer database. And now you want to start to grow them. Of course, you want to, uh, get them to buy a product. Once they've bought a product, they're now uh, part of your family. You want to be able to service that customer. You want to sell them additional products. You want to be able to make sure they're a happy customer. You want to be able to survey them. You want to, you're, they're, on a, they're on a journey. And it's a journey of using your products and expanding that and adopting them. And the more that you can uh, get that adoption, the better you're going to do as a company. Uh, I'll tell you that um, for, you already know this, uh, but for the last couple of weeks I've been in Hawaii. 
And just before I left uh, for Hawaii, I uh, got a nice little package uh, in the mail. And uh, the package was from a company that I love and have uh, worked with for a long time and good customer of ours, Fitbit. And this is this new Fitbit. And I put it on and it's a, you know, right away um, I start, I'm starting a journey with them. Of course, this is a connected product. It's connected to my phone. It's connected back to them. Um, as soon as I uh, uh, got the product and I get their app, you know, put, have to put their app on my phone, then I have to sign up. Now I have a, a, an email from them. I've got adoption happening. They're now emailing me out. Are you doing this? Have you tried that? Have you? Did, they're trying to upsell me. Did you also buy the scale? Um, oh, hey, would you join the community of other, you know, Fitbit? Have a scale. Uh, very important. Scale. Have you? Have you also um, joined the community of everybody else uh, who is your friends who are on Fitbit? And suddenly. I go from receiving a package in the mail to I have multiple products. Yeah. I'm joined together with all my friends, and I'm getting emails from them on a regular basis. And the interesting thing that happened was I'm in Hawaii, and all of a sudden I get an email from my friend Michael Dell, who's you know my neighbor, and he says, well, uh, are you feeling OK? <laughs> and I'm like, why? He's like, well, I noticed you didn't work out yesterday. I said. What do you mean I didn't work out yesterday? And he goes, well, you know, we're friends on Fitbit. You just added me to the Fitbit community. I'm mo monitoring you now every day. Now, to me, and that, to me, that's very creepy. That is just, that is creepy that he's monitoring you that way. Well, let's get to that. Let's get to okay. the creepy factor, because we're all heading to creepy. We yes. all know that. Yeah. And the people in the room here are making S it happen. Some more than others. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we, um, all of a sudden, I got a, this email, hey, you, did, did you not work out today? So I'm like, uh, so I looked at his, you know, I haven't really checked my community. You know, I'm doing like 10,000 steps a day. He's doing like 20,000, 30,000 steps a day. Actually, I'm convinced he puts this on his dog, and the dog goes around all day. Because I don't know how he does as many steps as he says, he's, as the system says he's doing. But, um, and then there's another, another fascinating part of the story, which is that this new, uh, product which they're launching here at the show, which is called the Charge HR, um, and uh, Michael has their Super Watch, which is also something that has this little green thing on the back. Have you seen that? It's an optical heart rate monitor, right? It's a little heart rate monitor. So, all of a sudden, we all of a sudden have all this really interesting data uh, on your heart rate. And the interesting thing about beginning just to starting to watch, and usually I, of course, I've worn a heart rate monitor for years. You probably have too where I'm at the gym, you know, I'm getting on the, the I'm getting on my uh, elliptical trainer or the treadmill, so you strap, you know, a, a band on your chest and you're running, you're working out, and it's giving you that information while you're working out, but now you're like getting it like 24-7, like I know exactly what my heart rate is, right here, it's 70. Okay, but okay. I want to, I want to, I want to, so I like, want to, I want to bring you back into the point you well, were making. I, I'm getting there, I'm getting new there. New relationship with customers, now I think, watch, is where you were going. Right? Well, isn't this interesting? Now let's think about Fitbit. What do they know about me? They know actually quite a bit about me. They, um, they know where I am. They know where I, they know that I just went on a trip. They, I've given the app, you know, the ability to know where I am to get, and have a geo-air location. They know my friends, okay, so they know the kind of people I hang out with. Um, they know how, how physically active I am every day. They also know my, they now know my heart rate. In the next version of this product, they're also gonna know my blood pressure and my hydration levels and my V2O max as well, okay? Uh, probably not too far from now, they're gonna know my insulin level on a regular basis. And um, uh, so they have connected with me in a whole new way. <laughs> And you think about that, this is a metaphor. It, th the reason I'm telling the story is so that you can start to get an idea of where we are going in the world with everything getting connected. And I, I, you mentioned that they're a customer, but I feel compelled to ask you if you have any other commercial relationship with, with Fitbit. I do a pretty good sales job for the product, don't I? Yeah. It's, I, I think it's one of the most remarkable products I've ever experienced. <laughs> Clearly. 
No, uh, by the way, I, you, you mentioned a journey, and I, I neglected to give all of you a preview of the journey that we'll be on in a very short period of time, which is toward the end, I'm going to open the floor up to questions, so, so please uh, start thinking about what those will be. Mark, one more question broadly about marketing and marketers, because there's a lot of them in the room. You, you've referred to the CMO as the customer journey officer, and I, I, your point is about the role of the CMO having changed. Would you elaborate on that? Well, I, I, honestly, I think it's the CEO as the customer journey officer. I, I don't think that this is about the CMO anymore. I think that this is about the CEO. I think the CEO is now in charge of the customer relationship. I think if you're a CEO and you're not in charge of the customer relationship, you're, gonna, you're going to um, uh, rapidly find out that you are. And a great example is Mark here is at the table here from Unilever. The last time I was at uh, CES, we were in a meeting with him and his management team. And, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about all the various great things they're doing. They're obviously huge marketers. Um, but all of a sudden, the question got asked, well, wait, what about our customer service desk? Who, what system are we using to manage customer service? What, what are we doing? We're advocating, of course, that they tie their... Um, not, just their, not just their website, but their customer service, their email marketing, their sales force, all aspects of their marketing into one you know, canonical file with their customer information. And um, that really opens the door that every aspect of the business becomes a customer-oriented business. Here we have the example of Fitbit, which I've uh, illuminated for you. Well, product organization is also now part of the customer story too. So what part of the company is not customer centric? See, Adam, in business, you can go around and meet with companies all over the world, which I have the pleasure of doing on a regular basis, and um, you find companies that are pivoted to their shareholders. You find companies that are pivoted to their employees. You have companies that are pivoted to um, their partners. I think that companies, all companies, are rapidly going to be pivoted to their customers. I think that we are in a world now where the customer relationship is paramount. And the story with Fitbit, imagine if Fitbit wasn't adoption oriented, if they didn't send me that email, if they didn't hook me up in the community, if they were not upselling me, they would not be the most exciting company in wearables. So that's why we all have to use that example to kind of reframe our own companies and think about what are we doing in sales, in service, in marketing, in community, in the applications that we're building, mobile apps, websites, um, even and, and the analytics that we need to run our business because all of these things are getting back to rebuild our customer relationships. And, and you've reminded me, I want to I want to take a brief digression into the subject of behavior. I don't remember when it was, five, six years ago, you became very active on social media. And I think maybe Facebook was the first iteration of that, but also Twitter, LinkedIn maybe, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. And it, it seemed crazy. You were on it all the time. And it turns out you were... As were you. Well, less than you, but you... Uh, I don't know about that, but okay. <laughs> but you were sampling, you were sampling yeah. behavior. You were finding out the way people were using this behavior, and you fairly, behavior, you fairly quickly integrated it into an enterprise technology company, which was unusual. Well, you know, what I'm, you know, you know in my day job, oh, I am, you know, the CEO of Salesforce, uh, which is now the fifth largest software company in the world. We just gave guidance that we'll do six and a half billion dollars in, uh, in, uh, in revenue this I'm sorry, year. sorry, you said fifth largest? Fifth largest. And our job is, our job is to, in software, when you're running a software company, is to always thinking about what's coming next. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you have your... You know, product number one, most companies never make it to product number one and then product number two. You want to have then product number one, product number two, product number three. And so I'm always looking for what's changing. And, uh, you know, my best way of learning about what's going on in the industry is to jump in and use the products myself. And so um, I did become an active user on uh, Facebook and Twitter. And what I found was that um, I was in and doing exactly what I'm advocating, which is I'm connected with these customers in a, in a new way. Customers were directly interacting with me. I was getting ideas from them. They were retweeting things. They were forwarding things. And all of a sudden, I realized I'm actually collaborating. And then I looked at the collaboration tools that we had inside our company, and I found them to be quite anemic. 
So the kind of traditional sharing tools that we had inside you know, these enterprises did not match the level of collaboration that you were getting in the public space. Now, what I realized was that what we had been working on in enterprise software for many years and kind of what we've been talking about up to this point actually in this conversation is systems of record. That is, we know what's going on with, you know, with the customer, with our accounting. We're, we're building systems of record. We're building big databases. That's what kind of classic CRM or ERP software did. Now, we're talking about systems of engagement. That is, you know, uh, the Facebook and Twitter are very boutique systems of engagement. Our concept and our idea at the time, which was very avant-garde, but now we're number one in, um, in uh, social tools in the enterprise or collaboration in the enterprise, is you directly integrate the system of engagement with the system of record. So now what happens is I'm the Fitbit customer, okay? I have a problem. My, my, my charge HR is not charging, or who knows what it is. I get on my mobile app. I get on my mobile app, I hit customer support. I say, customer support, my charge HR is not charging, can you help me? It goes to the customer support team at Fitbit. They get it, it's, it's a system of record at that point. Now they can do all the same things that you see with Facebook and Twitter. They're able to do status updates, they're able to collaborate, add people, share, auto-escalate, see if it's meeting certain SLAs and so forth. And all of a sudden, you are combining the best of both worlds. We can learn a lot, and we have, you know, from what is happening in the consumer markets to influence what we can do to make our enterprises much more efficient and much more engaged. And that, that's, I think, a, a big part of you know, our story. So if diving in and sampling social media was a big thing for you five years ago, mm -hmm. other than Fitbit, mm -hmm. what, are you, what, are you, what are you diving into and curious about right now? that you think I, might bleed over into yeah. a practical business application? Well, I think the next big wave is we are, you know, we're, we're in an AI spring. There's no doubt about that. An AI spring, artificial intelligence? And what we can see is that we've talked about this before, but, you know, today, if we go to a major medical center um, uh, in the United States here, you know, wherever it would be. We could be at UNLV here, we could go to... Um, the Benioff Hospital could, in San Francisco. You could go to the Benioff Hospital in San Francisco, you could go to UCLA, and you go in and you, whether you're a woman and you're getting a mammogram, or whether you're a man and you're getting uh, some ultrasound or whatever it is, or a CT scan, the first thing that happens is, of course, they're using state-of-the-art equipment made by GE or Philips or Siemens or whoever it is, and, you know, it may or may not be connected to your electronic medical record, but most of that data at that point is still systems of record engagement, okay? There's not that much, in, uh, there's still not that much collaboration happening, but there's one other major piece that's not going on yet, and that is that that equipment is still pretty, pretty dumb. That is, if you go in and get an ultrasound, you wait for the radiologist to kind of provide you with kind of feedback. Right. I think that's going to change pretty rapidly. We, you know, there was a great article on the front page of the New York Times last year that Google has this software that's wa that was able to watch 100,000 YouTube videos, and then it was able to derive a picture of a cat. Right. Right. But the software did not know what a cat was before it watched the videos. But then it figured it out. It was able to self-train itself. It was able to have that realization on its own. Now you're going to have that same kind of a technology, kind of applied to um, this kind of next generation of connected products. Let's use the ultrasounds or CT scans, you know, at, to start as an example. All of a sudden, that equipment is gonna say, gee, I, I see a problem here, or no, this scan is fine, you're totally healthy, or you know what, we need to bring in a specialist to look at this. That's not how the equipment works today, but we are on the verge of a big breakthrough um, really led by tremendous uh, computer science advancements in our major universities here in the United States. And are you seeing a, are you seeing a second derivative opportunity for either your company or, or your segment of the industry in that? For, for our company and I think for every company here, including yours, um, this kind of revolution in data science will fundamentally change how we run our business because we're going to have, computers are going to aid us in how we're running our business mm -hmm. and how we're interacting with our customers. 
And uh, the, you know, I'll, I'll give you a great example, which is, um, you know, uh, we have a great team at UCSF in, in prostate cancer. Okay, and they're they're, they're phenomenal. And you know what they what they've moved from uh, when you go in and you do a prostate cancer evaluation to they move from okay your your PSA is is going higher. Okay, um, well then we need to take you know some kind of intervention to what they call active surveillance because really they have gotten it now to the point where less than 10% of the patients where they have some kind of a clear uh, biomarker kind of moving up that they would jump in, okay? So now what they really think though is they can get it way below 10%. Maybe they can get it below 5%. They have the data, okay? But they can't, they can't really get there. That, that's the best team we have actually in the country, I think, or one of the very best teams in the country in, in prostate. But um, uh, if you now are going out to other you know, urologists or, you know, other teams and, you know, or other individuals who are going to make those decisions, they're not going to be able to make those decisions. They're going to have to go to radical intervention before they go on active surveillance. This kind of intelligence will make every doctor as good as the best doctor. And that is a pretty big breakthrough. And that will be true in every, that's a metaphor for how we're running our whole business. That is, Today, of course, you know, every marketer is wondering, well, am I doing enough? Am I, am I, have, I, have I achieved the same kind of level of sophistication yep. as this company or our competitor? And in the future, I think software is rapidly getting to the point where it's going to be able to get you to the point of being the best you can be. This is, this is an example. I love this example, and I try to drill in on it because I think it's a leading example of... Um, of, uh, where, of, uh, of connected products. But this is only, this is really the best metaphor for where we're all going. Now, I didn't finish my story. I told you that, here's my heart rate, maybe it's up a little bit since I've done my thing. Nope, it's only 71. The funny thing is, is, I, it's down to 69. The funny thing is, is now uh, at the end of every day, I look at the app and it shows my heart rate during the whole day. Usually, I'd only hear about my heart rate once a year when I went yeah. to go to the doctor, yeah. and then he'd take my heart rate. So I sent it to my cardiologist, and I said, you know, what do you think of this? And you know what he said? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know what it means, because all of the cardiologist's work today is really based on the Framingham study, which is like 20 or 30 years old. So they don't really know, even though we have all this kind of, here's my heart rate moment to moment, they don't really know yet. And even though Fitbit has this kind of canonical file that they're building of everybody's heart rate over time, you can imagine pretty soon what's going to happen, which is all of a sudden maybe it's going to say, gee, you should go to the doctor and get checked, or you should yeah. you go to the if hospital the, now, or whatever data, it is. Yeah, if the data set gets much bigger, by the way. but that It doesn't need to get a lot bigger. Just if you, the, the data sets actually can be relatively discreet hmm. to get really sophisticated uh, insights, and Mark. that's true for all of our businesses, and that's probably the next step for uh, in our industry over the next probably five year five years. Within five years, the conversation that we'll be having will be way beyond this because we will all be at this level. One quick, one more question for me, and then from the audience. The uh, the Wall Street Journal had what I thought was a provocative point today. They they had a headline that said something like, "The Empire Strikes Back." The biggest enterprise technology companies are finally getting their act together and they're going to you know they're going to step on the the upstarts now mm -hmm. you just mentioned you're the fifth largest software company now but you're still not as big as the other four are what microsoft well we are in our IBM, category and crm category. were okay we're number 1 but they're interested in yours anyway my what my my question to you is they're interested you in buy, growing again yes you, yeah and do you think they can well, you know, as I mentioned, technology is a is is an interesting industry because everything that we have today is going to be obsolete probably in about 36 months. Nobody has the iPhone that they had. Nobody has the BlackBerry. Nobody. I'm not going to want to wear this watch in 36 months. Mm -hmm. Probably won't want to wear this watch in 12 months. Probably have a new one. Um, that's what's cool about technology, but that's what's treacherous about being a tech CEO is that everything is disposable and you have to be ready and you look back at the history of the tech industry and it's littered with companies that didn't make the shifts. 
to your point, there's been four things that have, three things that have really driven our industry hard over the last decade. The cloud, which we've been doing for 15 years. Social networks, which you touched on very nicely with Facebook and Twitter and the kind of movement to systems of engagement. Now mobility. Everybody here is, um, has their phone with them. Pro several people here, like Mark, is sitting there with two phones. Many people have multiple phones with them. I, for now, for over a year, don't travel anywhere in the world with a computer. I only have my iPhone. All of our applications at Salesforce run on the iPhone. Every application I have in my enterprise has been moved to, the, to my iPhone. I can run my whole business from my phone. That's a huge shift, so the cloud, social, and mobile. Now we're in the fourth inning, and the fourth inning is this data science revolution. And this data science revolution is really an iteration on all these things because in the world of the cloud, you can rapidly get to revelations in regards to data that you could not get to if you, all of your software is, all of your data is discrete. And this is a great example. You could probably come up with a lot of other ones. It's fair for me to put you down as a no on those big companies uh, being able to, uh, to build I, again? I, you can put me down on the Andy Grove comment on only the paranoid survive, and you have to be watching everybody, but so far for us it's been uh, uh, good in our category. You know, maybe, they, maybe they can pick out other categories where they can get excited about, but so far, uh, you know, in our cat, we're, you know, we're focused on what we want to do, which is helping companies connect with their customers. I used up most of our time, but there is time for one or two I questions. I actually used it up, wall. but you did no, a very good no, job. You who, who would like to uh, ask a question? Yes. Uh, unless, is there one, no, there's one over here, Alan, so let's go with a. I don't think Alan's allowed to ask a yeah, question. He is, if no one else does. Please, just identify yourself if you would. Sure. Um, uh, my name is Charizad. I'm the founder and CEO of Broadband TV. I'm a computer scientist and I specialize in artificial intelligence and very excited to hear that you think that's the next big thing in terms of making a lot of these wearables adaptive, leveraging artificial intelligence. Would you say that meaning-based AI uh, or information-based AI, if you were to pick one of the two, which one would be more utilized in terms of building uh, the next best technology for making these devices more adaptive. And would you just repeat the, the two, I didn't get the two categories that you, that you referenced. Go ahead, Mark, you, you, you did, so. Meaning-based and information-based. Meaning-based yeah. and information-based artificial intelligence. Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 the computer science that, there's been a lot of computer science breakthroughs this year that I've been excited about, but the one that really got my attention was last year when Richard Socher published at Stanford his work on sentiment analysis and how he, for the first time, broke through the ability for a computer to understand the sentiment, the, 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 the motion behind a sentence. I think we had tried for many years to do kind of keyword analysis and do that, and then to see him have that breakthrough in the Stanford uh, team was amazing. With his new effort, he's now commercializing his work with, uh, with Metamind, I don't know if you've seen his demo that he's published on the, on the web, which is metamind.io. But now I think we see that both of the things that you're talking about, as well as what he is working on, um, uh, as there's also a great article today uh, by Richard Waters in uh, the Financial Times, we're on the verge of a huge breakthrough. I'm sure that you would agree that we are about to see um, uh, for the first time, this technology uh, be accessible to everybody. And for him, on his site, he has a couple of compelling videos. One of the, one of the most interesting ones is he has his platform running, he has APIs to his platform, and he has image, image input as well as um, text input. And on the image input, he basically puts in these pictures of different cookies, chocolate chip cookies and raisin cookies. But of course, he doesn't tell the computer what it is, it's self-training itself. And then at the end of it, he's able to put in a, a picture of a cookie and the, the software tells him which one it is, and then he's able to go out onto the net and search for all of those images and, and recall them. That is not something we were able to do a few years ago. And so now I think that we have the frameworks for what will set us up for the next, uh, Next wave. So among the uh, 
many interesting things we talked about. I was not familiar with the expression AI spring, and, and so I, I appreciate your, your bringing that up. That, that's fascinating. I've been told for a very important reason that was the last question, because it's dinner time. So please join me in thanking Mark Benioff. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Adam. Thank you. Thank you.